Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Avatar video. This is going to be like my final preview video ahead of the release of uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, The Rise of Kiyoshi. Um, this book is obviously out in exactly two weeks time, I'm recording this on the 2nd of July, it's out on the 16th, so two weeks to go. And uh, yeah, we're mainly going to be talking about the Amazon preview pages here, as well as I suppose the proper description or blurb of the book. Um, which I think is all pretty, pretty interesting. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be doing lots of review content and other stuff when this book is actually released. But for now, I do want to talk about this because included in this preview is the first couple of pages of the book. And I think it's definitely worth talking about to give you guys an insight into this is the way the book is written. We've seen, obviously, a chapter 7 before. But here is the opening of the book. And you get a better sense of what they're going for here rather than the out of context action scenes of, of the chapter 7. So anyway, here we have the, it's, this is Amazon.com, if you just go to the Rise of Kyoshi product page you can get the preview pages here, like so. So there's the cover, and then here, here, here is the, I suppose, proper description that we hadn't got before, but do have it now. I, I wish they'd released this a little bit earlier to give us this better sense of like what the book is actually about. But anyway, Justice begins with one woman. After nine years of desperate searching for the next Avatar, the discovery of young, charming Avatar Yun has brought stability to the Four Nations. That is, until Earth Kingdom-born Kyoshi, Yun's unassuming friend and servant, demonstrates remarkable bending during a mission to the South Pole. With the identity of the true Avatar at stake and the growing unrest among her allies turning into violence, Kyoshi is forced to flee the Avatar mansion with her fiery friend Rangi taking little more than the metal war fans and headdress her parents left behind. It isn't easy finding Avatar training on the run, but Kyoshi and Rangi find unlikely supporters in the Dao Fei, ragtag criminals and outlaws living in the shadows of the Earth Kingdom, torn between following the traditional path of an Avatar and seeking vengeance for those she has lost. Kyoshi struggles to accept her newfound power as she trains in secret, but while Kyoshi, Rangi, and her Daofei friends face off against brutal underworld rivals, those who seek to control the Avatar draw ever closer to her, leaving trails of dead in their wake. And then the last bit is something we've already read before. This is what they were always saying about it, but yeah. I bet definitely a better sense of what it's about. You know, the whole idea of we, kn we knew already that we'd go in and... It would take a while for Kyoshi to be actually, you know, understood to be the Avatar and that someone was actually mistaken for the Avatar at the start. And that's the situation we have here because Kyoshi is not all, not established to be a particularly great bender early on. But during chapter 7, which was the preview pages, we got the chapter called The Iceberg. And that's where we actually saw this moment happen. It's effectively Kyoshi, I think, using the Avatar state. Uh, without it directly being called that, but it, it seems very likely that that's what it is. And then, yeah, uh, going off from there, it's just this story of kind of Kyoshi on the run, what what exact path will her avatar journey take to eventually get her to the position where she becomes the character that we know she is. Uh, there is the mention of the war fans and the headdress, which are from her parents. So that explains a couple of things about why she eventually goes to that specific look and the importance of that um, so that that's very interesting to know about it um, but obviously some other stuff like when does the face paint come in and, and that sort of thing but uh, very very interesting still and a couple of mention of a few characters here but uh, the main thing to talk about here is this the first couple of pages of the book so chapter one is called the test uh, people who have the book already say that there are 32 chapters in the book uh, it's 442 pages or something like that. And um, the black and white illustrations that were mentioned before, I think is some sketch images in the back. I haven't seen any of them, but um, I assume it will just give some visuals for some of the characters in the book. So that's pretty interesting. So anyway, I think the main thing to talk about here is definitely the this opening chapter here and just what it does because we saw a big action scene and just by the nature of that action scene it wasn't revealing a ton about you know necessarily what was going on it was kind of very out of context it was, it was almost hard to follow unless you read it a few times here is the start of the book and you immediately see there is no need to worry about it being young adult as like the kind of uh, genre of the book there's depth here there's references all over the place um they're giving context to where they need to do. 
This book has descriptions. It is not just written in a very simplistic style. There is depth here without going crazy into depth like say a Lord of the Rings if you've ever actually read the, the books of Lord of the Rings. Uh, it doesn't go that far but it still gives you the place names and the interesting stuff that you want. So in a way like it really comes across as being one of the most if not the most in-depth things we've ever had in the Avatar universe. So anyway we'll just read a little bit of this. I'm not just going to sit here and read for like half an hour um, but um, we'll read a little bit of this and discuss it and then I'll highlight some other stuff from the pages as we go on. So the test. Yokoya Port was a town easy to overlook. Situated on the edge of Whale Tail Strait, it could have been a major restocking point for ships leaving one of the many harbours that supplied Omashu, but the strong reliable prevailing winds made it too easy and cost effective for southbound merchants to cruise right past it and reach Shimsam Big Island in a straight shot. Jean Zhu wondered if the locals knew or cared that ships laden with riches sailed tantalizingly close by while they were stuck elbows deep in the cavity of another elephant koi. Only a quirk of faith and weather uh, kept piles of gold, spices, precious books and scrolls from landing on their doorstep. Instead, their lot was fish guts, a wealth of maws and gills. Uh, the landward side was even less promising. The soil of the peninsula grew thick and rocky as extended further into the sea. It had disturbed John Zhu to see the crop field so meager and balding as he rode through the countryside into town for the first time. The farmland lacked the wild volcanic abundance of the Makapu Valley or the carefully ordered productivity of Ba Sing Se's outer ring where growth bent to the exacting will of the king's planners. Here a farmer would have to be grateful for whatever sustenance they could pull from the dirt. The settlement lay on the intersection of three different nations, earth, air and water, and yet none had ever laid much of a claim to it. The conflicts uh, of the outside world had little impact on the daily life for the Yokoyans. Uh, to them, the ravages of the Yellowneck uprising in the deep interior of the Earth Kingdom were, were a less interesting story than the wayward flying bison that had gotten loose from the air temple and knocked the ta thatching off a few roofs last week. Despite being seagoers, they probably couldn't name any of the dreaded pirate leaders carving up the eastern waters in open defiance of the Bossing Say Navy. All in all, Yokoya Port might as well might has might as well not have been on the map, which meant for John Zhu and Kelsang's desperate, sacrilegious little experiment, it was perfect. So, just that opening section there before we cut to a new scene, just like you know, two pages of content. There is so much here. Now, admittedly, it's the very start of the book. Of course, you have to set the stage here, but there's a lot going on of just Yokoya Port, which, at least right now, they seem to be, like, is this the original name for Kyoshi Island? They, they mention, like, a peninsula. Uh, I think roughly it seems to be, I think, where it would actually be positioned. Um, but still, you know, very, very interesting overall. A lot of what's going on here. Edge of the Whale Tail Strait. Shimsong Big Island is a new place. That's interesting. And then just a description there of Yokoya, even though it's a port and is actually positioned fairly well because of how good the, the like wind is and the, the ocean currents, people just tend to skip by it because it happens to, in addition to being well placed, happens to also have this really good kind of... Um, you know, weather around it, so people just zip by it instead of, you know, stopping there, and, you know, because of that, it has to become a fishing village, and so elephant koi is, like, a, one of the big things that they, to keep themselves alive. It's just, I think, really, really interesting world building of establishing here is a place that is sort of forgotten just because of circumstances, and because of that, the people here are in sort of trouble compared to, like, other places in the Earth Kingdom, and you know, all, all those references uh, as we go into page two here of like Makapu Valley, uh, volcanic abundance. And the, that's obviously Makapu Village, which is the fortune teller area. And of course, that's where the, the, the volcano is, of course. At uh, Bossing Se, we of course know there's no need to go into that, but nice to get it referenced. Mentioning of the Earth King there. Uh, intersection of Earth, Air, and Water in terms of the position, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and even just a little thing there of, you know, to them, the greater politics of the Earth Kingdom, the bigger issues happening 
are less important to them because of how out of the way they are than say the the almost minor story of like a sky bison got loose from one of the air temples and knocked you know the the roofs off a couple of houses and that's so fun to get because of the era we're in we're pre air nomad genocide of course so we actually can have these sort of stories of like regular people just experiencing like a sky bison going past because they're not a borderline extinct species anymore so uh, very very interesting similarly the mention of pirates here we, we saw them in avatar of course in that episode but um you know even the mention of you know just the bossing say navy that little bits and pieces that just add to it all uh, and as we'll go through it we'll just point out some of these references rather than just reading the full thing out but you know you see this is them entering Kelsang and John Zhu uh entering the the town and the idea is that uh, Kelsang is an airbender and John Zhu is an earthbender uh and they are going to perform the avatar test using the avatar relics which are the uh four kind of uh, sacred toys basically that are often used to determine if uh someone is the avatar because this is one of the things that the avatar kind of remembers across all of their lives that this is the toy is theirs in the same way of like Juan's teapot would would also be like a, a sort of relic in, in in a way and that's why Korra remembered the teapot it's why you know he, we get to see Kyoshi as this goes on at least be familiar with one of them uh, and we get the full details in the test as well that um the test is pick four toys from thousands of toys so it is a crazy big test it is not just a case of them bringing four toys in front of someone and watching the reaction no the person is asked to choose four from thousands and because of just the probability there there is a very low chance of you just choosing the correct four by mistake so it's very interesting as like the people of this town obviously who are sort of almost like uh you know struggling a little bit they they treat it as almost this kind of holiday festival of like this is an opportunity to change their lives in a way of their your know, child being the avatar so it's it, it's very interesting setup here for for all of this sort of stuff um as they mentioned you know they describe that here bison whistle wicker ball uh, stuffed turtle duck you know wh whales uh, whale bone bone spring and so on um Kelsang is setting them up um there's a mention here um yeah here we go um how did you change abbot dorje's mind about giving you all the relics he asked the same way you convinced lu bei fong to let us administer the air nomad test in the earth cycle kel sang said calmly as he re-entered uh re-centered a wooden top i didn't uh so that's very interesting there of the avatar test using the relics the toys is an air nomad specific thing usually but in this case they are using it during an earth cycle where the next avatar is an earthbender uh, because they've had such uh, bad luck basically trying to find the avatar because they, they established here that it's been uh, seven years since Korok, the previous avatar's death so um it things are getting pretty bad they mentioned that at this point in time this is the longest that the search for the avatar has ever taken uh, it's seven years trying to find the avatar up to now so it's also mentioned here that they basically just uh kelsang at least just took the relics he, he didn't actually ask permission in the same way that he uh uh Jean Zhu wasn't actually given permission to use the air nomad test in the earth kingdom that's why it was mentioned as being like sacrilegious earlier on so uh very very interesting stuff here because it's not just like this is them doing it to find the new avatar but it's because it specifically mentioned that these two were friends of avatar kurok because avatar kurok died so young they i suppose were close to him and were more or less the ones to train him as the avatar so they're able to sort of continue and be that role with the next avatar while still a, it being like the same age more or less type thing so it's the same kind of generation because of how little uh Kurok was around as it mentions here he passed away at the ripe old age of 33 we already knew that for we could figure out his age from um just the the other numbers um but uh yeah they mentioned the avatar cycle here so at least they, they make the book sort of at least accessible that they're not just assuming you immediately know the full details but you know very very interesting you know seven years since Kurok's death um 
No one knew why. Uh, the mention here of just some of the problems in the world as well here. Earth Kingdom lacked cohesion. Water tribes needing to unify. The airbenders need to come down from their mountains and get their hands dirty instead of preaching. So, you know, the, the typical, typical problems you'd expect from them. Interesting, though, and no mention of the Fire Nation. Now, of course, you know, it's in, in relation to this place, they specifically note that it's a, it's a, it's like a, a cross-section of like three nations rather than all four, but um, very interesting as well. But here we go. Uh, the only serious decree of Karuk, uh, of Karuk's before he departed from the living was that his closest companions find the next avatar and do right by them. And so far they'd failed spectacularly. Um, so that's an interesting one in that like a lot of the details around specifically why Karuk died so young are kind of murky. We assume it's because either Ko killed him or Karuk just died with exhaustion or something like that. Some combination of things by just devoting his life after the loss of Umi to constantly going in and out of the spirit world to find Ko to get him back and along the way he he passed away. They they almost get across the idea that he, he went on this mission to try and get Umi back knowing that he realistically probably wouldn't come back and so gave probably the first serious orders of his time as Avatar for them to search for the next avatar if he never came back or something like that i'm hoping the book probably maybe clears up some of that but um especially because we we, we know kel sang and john Zhu are at least in the book up to a certain point so you know them being actual friends of avatar kurok at least leaves it on the table for that to be discussed especially once i suppose finally it's discovered that kyoshi or even yun is the avatar and they get to that point of talking about past lives and stuff like that but uh, anyway, uh, very interesting stuff as we go on. Um, yeah, they, 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 they eventually get to the idea of um, the test happening. But they, here's an interesting point as well, just world building stuff. Earth avatars were traditionally identified by directional geomancy, a series of rituals designed to winnow through the largest and most populous of the four nations as efficiently as possible. Each time a special set of bone trigrams was cast, and interpreted by the earthbending masters. Half the earth kingdom was ruled out as the location of the newborn avatar. Then from the remaining territory another half, then another half again. The possible locations kept shrinking until the searchers were brought to the doorstep of the earth avatar child. Um, we also get mentioned down here, um, you know, Jean Zhu had been part of the expedition sent by the bones to the barren fields uh, empty gem caverns below Bossing Say, a patch of the Siwang Desert so dry that not even the sandbenders bothered with it. Liu Bei Fong had read the trigrams. King Burrow of the of Amashu gave her the shot. Nellie the gardener took her turn. Just mention of like I suppose at this point specifically noted earth earth bending masters of that generation, showing that there was a pro previous earth bender master in the history of Toph. So that's interesting. The Beifang family has one. Uh, previous king of Omashu, King Burrow. Um, interesting that it does have the BU at the start. So, you know, maybe he's properly suggesting to us that Bumi is actually part of some sort of a royal family line. Um, but, you know, I interesting. Another mention of a another king of Omashu. And then a, a, a character with a title. An earthbending master with a title, someone called the Gardener. That's that. That's interesting. Uh, I I wonder does the book at all mention why that name is there? But either way, interesting. Uh, they just mention here like the the parents were worse because the way the test has to go is like they bring the kids in and are like, you can choose one of these toys. If you choose one of the ones that like is the relic, you get to choose another, and then eventually like they get to choose four, and if they get them right. You know, they found what they need to do. But in most of the cases, they have to be like, no, sorry, we, we said you could pick a toy, but you actually can't keep it. Uh, and that, that causes a lot of problems here. And they kind of explain that this works better with the air nomads where, you know, their philosophy on things, they don't really care about that sort of stuff all that much. The, you know, owning like a, a items and stuff like that isn't as important. So, you know, the airbender children don't get as upset as like the earth kingdom children do and, and their parents um so uh as we go on we get uh yeah we we, we get 
the a, an initial attempt where it seems like someone actually finds that she's the avatar so that's very very interesting so here uh, the little girl had wandered over to the whirly flying toy that had once entertained an ancient avatar and was staring at it intently huh they weren't in intending to get a genuine result today but picking the first item correctly was already improbable too improbable to risk stopping now okay john Sue said this would have uh, this would have to come out of his own pocket 50 silvers a year if she's the avatar. 65 silvers a year if she's the avatar and 10 if she's not. Why would I pay you if she's not the avatar? Jean Zhu roared. So this is obviously him discussing some sort of a deal with um, the, the girl's father if she happens to be the avatar because he wants to make some sort of money off this. Uh, Kelsan coughed uh, and thumped loudly on the floor. The girl had picked up the whirly gig uh, and was eyeing the drum. Two out of four correct out of thousands. Holy shoe. So um, obviously Oma and Shu. I, I think there's a page in the preview that mentions someone saying something, something similar like Holy Oma or mentioning Oma in this sort of a way where it's just a phrase in the Earth Kingdom to express like shock or excitement. So interesting. Um, they shook hands. It would be ironic, a prank worthy of Kurok's sense of humor to have his reincarnation be found as the result of a peasant's greed uh, and the very last child in line for testing to, to boot. Uh, Zhu nearly chuckled. Now the girl had the drum in her arms as well. She walked over to a stuffed hog monkey. Kel Sang was beside himself with excitement, his neck threatening to burst through the wood through the wooden wooden beads wrapped around it. Jean Zhu felt light headed. Hope bashed against his ribcage, begging to be let out after so many years trapped inside. The girl wound wound up her foot and stomped on the stuffed animal as hard as she could. Die, she screamed, and you know, she just stamps on it. So this girl actually isn't the avatar. She just happened to get lucky with uh, the first couple of picks. So, um, and I think that means that she, it, it, that confirms to us like three of the items. And then this is where they meet Kiyoshi. So they realize that there is actually another girl outside watching on. Uh, and they think it's initially this guy's other daughter. But, you know, it's revealed that it's actually an orphan. So, yeah, she was much, much taller than any of the other children who'd been brought in by their parents. Um, the girl quavered, threatening to flee. But her curiosity won over her fright. Underfed. And he just notes some stuff about that. Uh, the kind of area and stuff like that uh, and he explains this is like where yeah the, the villagers had dressed all their uh, children up in their finest garments as if it was a festival day but this child was wearing a threadbare coat with her elbows poking through the holes in her sleeves oversized feet and stuff like that so she had the biggest feet of every avatar that's one of the things about Kiyoshi so very nice reference there um, so yeah then they offer her the test as well so you, you could would you like a toy Um and yeah as quick as a whip she scampered by him snagged an object off the floor and ran back to where she was standing on the porch she gauged uh, Kel Sang and John Zhu for their response as intently as they watched her Kel Sang glanced at John Zhu and tilted his head at the clay turtle Kyoshi clutched to her chest one of the four true relics not a single candidate had come anywhere near it today they should have been as excited for her as they'd been about evil little Suzu, but John Zhu's heart was clouded with doubt. It was hard to believe that they'd been so lucky after that previous head fake. Um, so, interesting. They offer her another toy, and she just kind of, uh, you know, stops really interacting with them, and then she, she just runs away with this one toy. Um, you know, she, she, with this one-of-a-kind, centuries-old avatar relic in her hands. And this, at, at this point, page 12 stops, and we don't actually get page 13 and 14. Um, and we skip to nine years later. So we don't actually get, I think, what is the last two pages of chapter 1. And instead, we move on to, like, obviously chapter 2. Uh, you know, so then we have Kyoshi. Um, uh, Neutral Jing mentioned here in the, in the earlier chapters. Uh, I'm not going to go too much longer on in the video just because at this point we're getting into more kind of spoilers and stuff like that. But you can see other characters here. Oma, who was mentioned in the previous chapter actually. Um, this is where the Avatar Mansion is mentioned and that uh, they, they seem to they get across the idea that uh, Kyoshi is actually working in the Avatar Mansion, which is where 
Avatar Yun is actually being like trained. So um, something happens, obviously. Uh, I don't know if it just happens in the remaining two pages or just it's off screen. Something along the line happens in that. I, I, I get the impression that they probably... They finally get Kyoshi, get the item back. And then when they come back, Yun is there or something like that. He ends up like accidentally getting all four avatar relics and choosing them and maybe with the idea that like he watched the events that we saw just there of like suzu choosing three out of four and then kiyoshi choosing the last one and then realized like oh i can be the avatar if like they if i pick them all correctly or something like that and um, when in fact you know I, I assume the reason maybe why they keep kiyoshi around is because like okay this guy happens to be the avatar but this girl there's also something about her and she did choose one of the relics so like they just keep her around and um, I'm not really sure but um you know without, without going too much into the, the the preview pages here that's that seems to be the idea so yeah um overall as you can see here just from like the first couple of pages of the book loads of depth they're exploring topics expanding on stuff that we knew little bits about before like the avatar relics explaining the full concept to us that it's an air nomad thing but they're using it here for an earth uh, avatar they explain the earth kingdom's way of usually finding an avatar and i assume there's a different way for waterbenders and also um f firebenders to find out their avatars as well which is uh, very very cool and interesting uh, along with just all the, the place names, the references to characters that make sense without feeling like overly, like, we're writing the book based around references. It all feels fairly, you know, on point of like, yeah, of course there'd be an important Beifong from the past because, yeah, why they're a popular, fa a noble family now has to be informed in the past. And, you know, it makes sense that, you know, there is earth bending somewhere in that line to explain why, like, you know, Top has it and stuff like that. So, you know, very interesting stuff. A previous king of Omashu, lots of nice references, Makapu Village and stuff like that. Um, and then I think there's one thing I, I do want to cover on one of these pages, actually, before I uh, before I end the video. Um, it was a pretty f fun reference when I saw it for the first time. Um... Where is it? Yeah, here. Uh, Master Zhanzu was indeed from the Ganjin tribe up in the north. So that's very interesting, uh, as well as the fact that Suzu continues on as a character here, at least initially. Um, but yeah, Ganjin tribe re re reference, uh, Gan um, <laughs> Great Divide reference is really, really fun. Uh, whether or not there's more depth gone into here, I, I'm not really sure. But it makes sense. That's the sort of stuff that makes sense. That the characters are from somewhere in the Earth Kingdom if they are an earth kingdom citizen if they are an earthbender so they all have like an origin and it happens that he's from the ganjin tribe so that's fun and they have their like history i suppose in the north which is is interesting um but uh yeah that that's my kind of early kind of preview thing here for rise of kiyoshi like i said i'll be doing lots of review content when i get the book i'll be doing like a non-spoiler review then a spoiler review as much as I can, of course. And then I'll probably be doing... I think I said I already I'd, I'd be doing something like this. But some sort of a chapter-by-chapter uh, chapter sort of book club style thing of like going through the book. Uh, groups of chapters at a time to explore every single detail that is present in the book. Like any new fact details that I think is important. Um, as well as just, you know, obviously analyzing and reviewing the content of the story on a deeper level as well. So we'll be doing lots of that, lots of podcast stuff. You will see tons of Rise of Kyoshi content from me once the book is out. Two weeks from today, July 16th, make sure you get your copy as well, because this looks really 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 good so in the comments let me know what your thoughts are on this preview for the book as uh, seeing the first couple of pages getting a proper description as well for the book and um, what are your thoughts what's your excitement level as we head into the book so that has been the video thanks for watching and bye